seated. And as you are, take out your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 9 this evening. Galatians chapter 1. Paul is writing to the churches in the region of Galatia. Not one singular church, but a handful of churches in the region of Galatia. That would be found on a modern day map. That would be Turkey. So where it sticks out over the Mediterranean Sea uh, would be where Galatia is. These churches had likely been planted by Paul on his first and second missionary journeys. He, he went through this area, spent a good bit of time there. He had some, some interesting things happen to him uh, while he was in the region of Galatia. In the first five verses, what we looked at last week, Paul lays out his calling and his office. He is an apostle. Specifically, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. He hadn't been chosen by men. As a matter of fact, we know if the apostles had been looking to add to their number, they wouldn't have chosen Saul of Tarsus because he was a persecutor. He was a blasphemer. He says in another passage that he was injurious to the church. So he wasn't chosen by men. He was chosen by God. Very specifically, he was knocked off of his horse as he was on his way to Damascus to, to take uh, and arrest believers and, and continue to persecute them. But he was knocked off of his horse and a bright light shone and a voice from heaven said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It was Jesus speaking to him. While he wasn't chosen by men, he was chosen by God. He was recognized by men. It was recognized by the church. We talked a little bit last week. That matters. To be, to be recognized by the church. A similar thing happens now when we ordain someone to the, to the gospel ministry is how it's phrased. We, we don't actually ordain, though, do we? Who ordains someone to the gospel ministry? Well, God does. But it is, it is worthy of note that the church recognizes that ordaining, that gifting. And so that's what happened with the Apostle Paul. He wishes upon these churches the blessings of grace and peace. He says there in verse 3, grace be to you and peace from God the Father. Grace is necessary for salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And peace is the natural outflowing of someone who has experienced the grace of God. If you are, remember, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus our Lord, so walk ye in him. If you've accepted his grace through faith and you are now living by faith and in his grace, you will experience the peace that God offers. You can't have peace without grace. Okay? You can't have peace without grace. You should write that down somewhere because that's a key to the, the epistle to the Galatians. You can't have peace without grace. We'll get into that here this evening. And so Paul is writing this letter to these churches because their peace is being threatened. Their peace is being threatened. So he's writing this letter and kind of uh, he's going to give them a pretty stern talking to. And you'll see that in just a couple moments. But before we do that. I want you to talk back to me here this evening, and I want you to tell me, what is the gospel? The truth. It's the truth. But let's get, let's get real practical. If I don't know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, what do I need to know? You say, well, you need to know the gospel. Okay, what is it? What, what do you need to know in order to go to heaven after you die? What, what is the gospel? Absolutely. Very good. Very important. Everything that he just said is important. There's a lot of things that, that you, you have to know and you need to include it. Probably the best place that we find it encapsulated in Scripture is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, which says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I, re also I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, 
and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. There's the gospel. In a, in a very small nutshell, there's the gospel. Okay? When it says Christ, what does that mean? Jesus. Jesus is, but who is Jesus? He's the Son of God. That matters. The, it, he can't just be some somebody. He can't be the Son of, of a man and a woman. He is the Son of God. Okay? There's a lot contained in that principle that Christ died for our sins. Why does that matter? Kind of off of what Don said. Why did I need someone to die for my sins? Because I'm a sinner. It's the only way to get to heaven. Because the wages of sin is death and all have sinned. And I can't die for myself because I'm a sinner. Someone who didn't have sin died for me. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again the third day. If he'd stayed dead, he wouldn't have defeated death. He'd have lost. But he didn't. He, he was crucified for our sins, for my sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So... How does salvation, if I understand this, if I understand what you see before you, I understand I'm a sinner. Jesus is the Son of God. And he, he died for me, and he will forgive my sins. How, how does it become mine? How do, how, do I, how do I receive the gospel? By grace. By grace? Through faith. Through faith. In Jesus, in the finished work of Christ. Yep, we've, we've gone down that path before, haven't we? Yep. Yeah. How, how do I get it, though? Because if, if we say, well, it's by grace through faith, does, is everybody saved? Because God offers his grace to all. Is everybody saved? I, I have to, if, if we were to, to put it in biblical terms, Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call... Upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if I just say, Jesus saved me. If I can go out on the street and I can walk up and find lost people. And I can get them to say those couple words after me. They're saved, right? No, they have to have an understanding of the gospel. What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? Well, John 3.18 says, he that believeth. Is not condemned. That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord. To believe. He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then John 1 12 says that as many as received him, as many as call on his name, as many as believe, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So in order for someone to be saved, they have to know about Jesus, right? There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. They have to know that they are a sinner. They have to know that Jesus died for their sins. They have to know that he rose again. And they have to be willing to call on him to save them from their sins. Would you agree with that? Is that a, is that a, good, a, a good capsule form of the gospel? Okay. Okay. That's really important that we know that. Now, another thing. What else do I have to do in order to be saved? What else do I need to do? Repent. We could say that that goes along with calling on the name of the Lord, meaning to confess. To, to, I'm not going to call on a Savior if I don't think I need one. So there's, there has to be an understanding. The Bible says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. There does have to be an understanding I'm a sinner. He's a savior. I can't save myself. What else do I have to do in order to be saved? Ask Jesus to forgive you. Ask, ask Jesus to forgive me. Call upon the name of the Lord. Believe. Yeah. What else do I have to do? Admit. Admit I need a savior. Yep. Yeah. Call upon the name of the Lord. What else do I need to do in order to be saved? Accept, accept the gift of salvation. And beyond that, what else do I need to do? I don't need to do anything, right? Do I need to be baptized? Do I need to give money to the church? Do I need to be confirmed? Does it help if my dad's a pastor? No. What else do I need to do? I don't need to do anything. It's done, right? So the gospel is 
I get back to what we've said countless times. We are saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ. Plus nothing. Not plus our works. Now, hold that in mind, what the gospel is. Because if, if you don't have a good understanding of what the gospel is, then Galatians gets real muddy real fast. But we know what the gospel is. You knew before you got here. So, here we go. Let's start into verse 6. The Apostle Paul starts out, he comes out, guns are blazing, and he charges them with desertion. He says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. The word marvel is the Greek word thamadza. It means to be amazed, astonished, astounded. The Apostle Paul's mouth is hanging open as he hears of what's going on in the churches of Galatia. He doesn't mess around with pleasantries. He, he introduces himself. He speaks of his, awful, uh, of his office. He wishes them grace and peace, and then he just cuts right to the chase. Paul has seen quite a bit in his travels. But what is it that knocked him back on his heels that he saw in the churches of Galatia? Well, he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I'm going to give you several different word studies tonight because it opens up a lot in, in the passage. The word removed means to exchange, to pervert, to change sides. He says, I marvel that you change sides. This is a term. This, this Greek word is used for one in the military who deserts their ranks and goes and joins the enemy. We would call it treason. In the Greek, this is a reflexive verb, which means it's a voluntary action. As you read, something, it would be possible that you have so soon been removed. It's not that you've been removed. He says, I marvel that you've removed yourself, that you have turned traitor by your own choice. He, he's, he's, he's just set back by this. Now, this is a pretty strong accusation from the Apostle Paul. I, I'm amazed that you've deserted so quickly. I'm amazed that you switch sides. He's, he's accusing them of, of deserting God. He's accusing the Galatian believers of making a conscious choice to walk away from truth and embrace error. We've talked about repentance. To repent means a change of mind that results in a change of direction. If I'm going into sin and I repent, it means I stop, I turn, and I go towards God. But they have been going towards God, and they stop, they turned, and now they're going towards error. And they made a conscious choice to do so. The error that he says here, and he, he speaks of them going unto another gospel... This error, as we'll see in the coming verses and in the chapters to come, it's the message of the Judaizers. The Judaizer, Judaizers were those who tried to combine Judaism and Christianity. They said, in order to be saved, you need to, you need to take the, the law of Moses, particularly circumcision, but some of the ceremonial law as well, you need to take... The, the law of Moses, you need, to, you need to be saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ and be circumcised. You need to keep some of the law. You need to observe the feast. You need to, you need to do these particular things. Judaizers. You hear the word Jew in there. Now, this was especially common. The, the doctrine of the Judaizers was especially common in the early days of the church, it was easy for, for them to come along and, and try to, to push Judaism into Christianity because Christianity has undeniably Jewish roots, does it not? Jesus Christ was a Jew. His apostles were Jews. He spent his whole ministry in the area of the Jews. Okay? It has undeniably Jewish roots. And so when a Judaizer came to the churches in the Galatian area and they said, hey, you know what? There's actually more to the gospel. You're yeah, you're supposed to believe in Jesus and 
And they introduce all of this error. And the Apostle Paul marvels that it took no time at all for them to choose to switch sides away from the grace and peace offered through Christ to the bondage of work salvation. Why would you want to add the Jewish law to grace? It doesn't make any sense. For us to say, well, it, it, it's just easier that way. No, it's not easier. There's nothing easy about the law. <laughs> what is the purpose of the law according to the book of Romans? It is a schoolmaster to bring us to grace, to bring us to salvation. And, and here they're adding it. But Paul goes further. It's not simply that they had, had walked away from God's truth. They actually deserted from him that called you into this grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul is writing to believers. He's not writing to the lost. He's writing to the churches in Galatia. When it says that called you, that word, the Greek word kaleo, it's an aorist participle. You say, who cares? Here, here's why it matters. An aorist participle is something that began in the past at a point in time, and it carries on indefinitely into the future. He says, he's called you. We are eternally secure. He's called you, and you are in Christ. He's called you once and for all. What are they called to? Well, the grace of Christ is what it says. For from him that called you into the grace of Christ. And Paul is flabbergasted that it's taken so little time for the believers in Galatia to voluntarily turn their backs and walk away from the one who called them into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, take a look down at your Bibles and, and look in verse 6. That the last two words, it says... Another gospel. There's a play on words that goes on here that we lose in English, but it's neat to find out. The word another, there at the end of verse 6, is the word heteros. Heteros. It means another of a different kind. The world would describe me as a heterosexual. Okay? I am attracted to another of a different kind. Kind. That's actually the only biblical way, by the way. We could go down a rabbit trail there, but we won't. Heteros. Okay? He says, you've gone to another gospel, another of a different kind. Okay? Not the same gospel, not a different breed of the same thing. You are attracted to another gospel. You've gone, you've forsaken what Jesus gave you, and you've gone towards Another gospel, another of a different kind. Let's talk about that other gospel, shall we? Now, you see it in quotes, and the reason it's in quotes is because of what he says in verse 7. He says, which is not another. Okay, What did he just say in verse 6? That, that you, you've gone away uh, from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. Well, what does he mean? Well, again, it's a play on words. In verse 6, he talks about the heteros gospel. Here, in verse 7, it's an alos gospel. It's another of the same kind. So, essentially, if we were to use the English words that would make up this Greek statement, he says, I'm amazed that you've left the one who called you to, to himself, and you've gone after another gospel, which is no gospel at all. It's, you've gone to another gospel. What does gospel mean? Do you remember? Good news. Okay? He says, you've gone from the gospel to another gospel, and it's not good news. It's not, it's no gospel at all. When you add works to salvation, to the gospel, the good news, you may get bad news. Romans chapter 11, verse 6 says, this is talking about the process of salvation, and it says, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Would you agree with that? You should. It's right there in black and white in, in Scripture. Okay. If it's of grace, 
then it's not of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You cannot mix grace and works. When you add grace to works, it's not work anymore. When you add works to grace, it's not grace anymore. Those two don't mix. They always destroy the other. And so the Apostle Paul here is marveling. He says, you left, you, you've turned away, you deserted the gospel, the, the good news of salvation by grace through faith in Christ, and you've gone towards another gospel, and it's no gospel at all. It's not good news. You've added works, and it's a problem. He says, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He's still marveling that they would be willing to give up the genuine good news for a counterfeit that will only rob them of their grace and peace. Verse 3, where he says grace and peace, he, he's as much as telling them, hey, the road you're headed down, there's no grace, there's no peace there, because it's not good news. In perverting the gospel, it, it doesn't end well. This bad news message that the Judaizers were spreading would do two things. Here in this verse, in verse 7, he says, There be some that trouble you. The word trouble is the Greek word terasso, meaning to agitate, to deeply disturb, to disquiet, to stir up. If you're part of Sunday school, we're talking about quieting a noisy soul. This word right here, there are some who trouble you, who make noise, who are stirring you up, who are agitating the churches of Galatia were being unsettled and they were being deeply shaken by this false gospel, this twisted message. So it will bring trouble and it would pervert the gospel of Christ, according to verse 7. To pervert, meaning to corrupt, to transmute, to cause a turn for the worst. What do you call life-saving medication with cyanide in it? You call it poison, don't you? What do you call the gospel with works in it? It's not the gospel. It's not life. The gospel gives life. When you add works, it brings death. It brings this perversion of the gospel of Christ. And that's why Paul's upset. He, they're messing with something that's near and dear to his heart. They're messing with the beautiful, wonderful, good news of Jesus Christ, and they're, they're making it of none effect. They're perverting it. They're twisting it to their own ends. Adding works to the gospel is not a slight customization. It's a complete and total perversion and destruction of the gospel. Sometimes... We look at it, and we don't make it as bad as it should be. Because you probably know people who hold to this belief, and I do too. I know people who believe that salvation is, is, is through Jesus Christ. And, and that's not just a little bit. What, what difference will that and make in eternity? It's the difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between life and death. And so the Apostle Paul is marveling here in verse 6 where he starts, I marvel that you walk away from the grace and peace that's offered to you through salvation by grace through faith alone, and you're adding works to it. Why would you do that? Why would you pervert? Why would you twist? Why would you trouble yourselves in this way? And to make his point, he gives a double curse. A double curse. How serious is Paul about what he's saying? About those who would pervert the gospel? Well, look at verse 8. He's, he's going he's gonna to overstate his case here a little bit. He says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 
as we said before. So say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that he have received, let him be accursed. Do you hear the repeat in those two verses? He says, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, they're accursed. And then he says, I say again, if any man comes to you and preaches another gospel, he's accursed. Maybe you're asking yourself, why would anybody believe the Judaizers? It's a, it's a good question. Why, why would anybody believe this? They had the gospel, and in comes this group of people, and they say, hey, we've got more information. We, we've got more that we need to tell you. If you want to be saved, if you want to, if you want to have peace with God, then you have to do all of these things. Why would anybody want to believe that? Well, because the Judaizers were a tricky bunch. They came with good credentials, very good credentials. The first church council in Jerusalem, you remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago. The first church council, which was when all of the apostles and many of the, the leaders in the early church, people who had been with Jesus and, and the, the immediate uh, group there, the church in Jerusalem, and, and some delegates from far away came together, and they, they, had, they had a talk. They were talking about the Judaizers and, and such. And out of that first church council, they wrote a letter to the Gentile churches addressing false teachers. Listen to this from Acts 15, verse 23. This is at the first church council, the, the believers. This would be Peter and, and James and John. They're here. It says, and they wrote a letter by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch. Antioch of Pisidia is one of the cities in Galatia. Okay? And Syria and Cilicia. Cilicia would be a, a territory right next to Galatia. So they're sending this letter to this area where Galatians would, would be sent as well. Here's what it said. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. What's going on here? Who are the Judaizers? Well, they come from Jerusalem. They come with good credentials. They say, hey, I, yeah, I know Peter. I know, I know John. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I know Barnabas, of course. Hey, we've got some new information for you. So they're coming with really good credentials. That's why people bought it. People bought it because they came, they had these good credentials, that these false teachers telling people in, in these, these churches that they had come from Jerusalem. Hey, the, the apostles sent us. We've got, we've got more information for you. These people would have affirmed the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. They would have bought into all of that. If they hadn't, they wouldn't have been allowed to stand up in the church and say a thing. But they say, uh, yeah, we, of course. Yeah, I know Peter. Yeah, I, I, we believe in Jesus. We believe he came with uh, Mary. And uh, we know that. And he, he lived, died, and, and we believe that he rose again. And you need to accept him and you need to keep the law. That's the problem. They came, they were tricky. They came in with the right credentials. And then they add works to the gospel of grace. And Paul speaks in as strong of terms as he can in this verse. In verse 8, he says, Though we or an angel from heaven, he, we'll start off, though we. What group is that? He says, essentially, if any of the men who originally came through preaching, if, if Paul or Barnabas or Silas, if any of those comes through and they've been corrupted by the, Gentile, by, by the Judaizers and they start preaching another gospel, don't listen. Don't listen. If we come in and we preach that, do you think the Apostle Paul was worried about himself going in there? I don't think so. He, he knew who he believed in, he says. He then says, Though we or an angel from heaven, if Gabriel himself comes and tells you something other than the truth of 
Christ. Now, obviously, an angel from heaven wouldn't do this. An angel in he of heaven, a, a, one of the, the holy angels, as they're called in Scripture, could not do this. But Paul here is overstating his case to drive home the sincerity of his statement. Look, I don't care if it's somebody you know. I don't care if it's an angel from heaven. If they come and they preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, if they come to you with this other gospel, this heteros gospel, this other of another kind, if they come to you with that, then that which we have preached to you, he says, let him be accursed. The word, the Greek word anathema, meaning devoted to destruction or bound under a curse. If it's, if it's somebody you know, if it's an angel from heaven, and they come and they're preaching that other gospel, they're accursed. Believer's Bible Commentary made this statement. I thought it was, it was interesting. It says, whereas the law was a curse for those who fail to keep it, the gospel has a curse for those who seek to change it. That's true. The, the law... If you break the law, the Bible says that sin is the transgression of the law and that the wages of sin is death. But here the Apostle Paul says, hey, if you go and you start meddling with the gospel, you start adding to the gospel or taking away from the gospel. If I say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and Joseph, that's adding to the gospel and it nullifies the gospel. When you add to or when you take away from the gospel, the Apostle Paul says, let him be accursed. And in verse 9, he, he repeats himself, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we have received, let him be a curse. Paul's going to repeat himself for the folks in the back here. He's, hey, hey, listen up. You heard what I just said. If we or if an angel or if anyone else comes and preaches another gospel, it's significant, though he says, Another gospel unto you than that ye have received. That word receive means to accept, to take unto, to acknowledge. It's another aorist tense, which means, just as with salvation, received, point in time, with an ongoing, an ongoing effect. What do we call someone who has accepted or received the gospel of Jesus Christ? We call him a Christian. Why? Well, because that's what the Bible calls him. Paul is writing this. Note, note what he says there. He says that he's writing this to born-again people. These are born-again believers who make up the churches of Galatia. Preachers of false gospels are to be accursed. How seriously did Paul take false teachers? Deadly serious. It's, it's as serious as life and death because it is life and death. It's the difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between being in the spirit or being in the flesh. It's, it's everything. He takes this very seriously. How seriously should we take false teachers? You say, well, false teachers, we don't really have false teachers today. Oh, we do. False, false teaching, false teachers, is not something that has just kind of faded away in their intervening years since the first century. We have false teachers today. False teachers and their perverted gospels are more prevalent today. And they're more readily accessible today than they've ever been in the history of mankind. You can get online, you can get on your phone, you can turn on your TV, you can turn on the radio, you can go to a Christian bookstore, and you can buy false gospels. You can read false gospels. They're everywhere. One man said, the outward person of the messenger does not validate his message. Rather, the nature of the message validates the messenger. Let me say that again. The outward person of the messenger does not validate his message. Rather, the nature of the message validates the messenger. The fact that we like their personality, the college they went to, the political candidates they endorse, the books they've written, or the conference they speak at, 
doesn't lessen the fact that if they're perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ as revealed in Scripture, what are they to be to us from this passage? They are to be a curse. That's a really strong word, a curse. 2 John 9, written right at the end of, of the, the scriptures, when, when God was still inspiring his word, it says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come un any unto you and bring not this doctrine, what, what doctrine? This doctrine. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Well, this sounds, this sounds a little bit extreme, doesn't it? It does if we look at it through our eyes. But how seriously does, does God take people who go and pervert the gospel of his only begotten son? As serious as anything can possibly be. How, how seriously would you take the death of your child? Well, God takes the death, the sacrifice of his son, seriously. You say, but 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 I, I really like so and so. I really like this 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 ministry. I put that in quotes. I really like how I really like how they talk about some stuff. I know I know they're all wrong about, about the gospel. What should we do? From this passage, what should, our, what should our response be? It should be that they are accursed. What's the price you would put on grace and true abiding peace? What's it worth to you? What, what's grace and peace worth to you? Is it worth turning them off? Is it worth putting the book down? Is it worth... Taking that tab off of your browser, is it worth that to you? Because false doctrine, a, another gospel, is deadly serious to the Lord, and it should be to us. Peace, you remember what I said earlier? Let me get it so I can say it exactly. Grace is necessary for salvation. Peace is is the natural outflowing of having accepted the grace of God by faith. And then I said at the beginning of this message, you can't have peace without grace. What happens when you add works to grace? It becomes not grace. Peace only comes where grace is at home. Grace is only possible when works are out of the picture. Now, we're talking about for salvation, okay? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You remember Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4? By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's salvation. From there we go into, into sanctification, which says in verse 10 of Ephesians 2, and we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto Good works, not for salvation, because of salvation. When you add good works to gain salvation, you lose grace entirely. And you've gone into a heteros gospel. You've gone into another gospel, and another gospel is no gospel at all. If you take the good news out of the gospel, then it becomes bad news. That's what happened in Galatia. That's why Paul writes this letter. That's why he goes right into it, right out of the gate. He says, hey, I'm amazed that you walked away from what God has offered you freely by grace and you're trying to add works to it. A little bit later, he's going to say that he, he said it, he's going to call them foolish Galatians. He says, what you've begun in the spirit, are you going to make perfect in the flesh? No. What, what God will do in us, he'll do by grace. Grace matters. Remember that as we go through the rest of Galatians, here's, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about this other gospel and the, the importance of maintaining doctrinal purity. Any, any questions before we wrap up here this evening? Yes, sir. I, I had a discussion one time with an old 
coworker of mine, a young guy who um, he was Catholic, and I asked him, you know, how do you believe in you know, go to heaven? And he agreed, oh yeah, by you know, death of Jesus Christ. And he said, that only or an additional thing? He said, well, in the death of Jesus Christ, and I said, and it, well, I don't really see how believing in the additional things would matter if you know we had wasn't hurting if we had that in with it. Is this where you would take someone to Galatians to show, like, well, the Jews the Judaizers were doing the same thing. They were adding works to their belief. Galatians would be one, if I was able to have multiple conversations with the person, I would definitely take them to Galatians. If I was only going to be able to talk with them, what I mentioned there, Romans eleven six 6, is, is, is probably the most succinct place. That's where it says, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. And if it's of works, then it's no more of grace. So you can't you can't mix the two. Yeah, told them about you know Ephesians where it says that it's not of works. They said, but what? Did, but then he just got there. He said, well, what does it hurt? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what? I've talked to people and that they're they're kind of trying to hedge their bet of well, yeah, I believe yeah, in Jesus and I live a good life. Yeah. And they're depending on their good life, but. If someone thinks that they can earn their way to heaven and they don't genuinely, they haven't repented of their sins because they feel that they're still good enough. Yeah. So it, it goes back to the original gospel. It's by grace through faith because I can't save myself. Because, yeah, because like you said, if the gospel means good news, that doesn't sound like good news if I've got to work my way towards my salvation. That's a lifetime of failure. A life without grace is a life without peace because when have you done enough? When when have you when have you when, when has the scale tipped in your favor? You can't see it because it doesn't exist, we know, but there's no peace because if you're trying to work for it, then you never know. Have you have you done enough? If you were to die right now, have you done enough? I don't know. So yeah, there's no there's no peace where so you where you add works. He then eventually said, Well, that I think if someone, you know, makes their best effort, you know, and then like, well, that's, you know, a scary thing because one man's best effort could be a lot less than another guy's, but still, oh, that's my best effort. If you could get into heaven without, by your works, then God is a monster because he sent his son to die. Why would you send your son to die if there was another way? We know there is no other way. It's only by the shedding of the blood. Why would you? Why would God offer his son for the sins of men if he could have just said, be on your best behavior? He didn't. He sent his son because that's the only way. Yes, sir? You see that uh, Paul was a disruptor of the gospel. You know, God knocked him off his horse to, to straighten him out. So you see the seriousness of preaching another gospel. You'd like to see some, more, some of these guys knocked off their horse, and uh, but uh, because they aren't, is that because we're living in the age of grace? I mean, it happens. A lot of the, the seriousness that you just talked about is be accursed, and there's a lot of people doing it. Yeah, but there's not a lot of people getting knocked off their horse. Happens from time to time, though. Yeah. You can probably you could probably name a couple false teachers who had a public uh, fall from a horse, yeah. uh, as it were. Yeah. It does happen from time to time, but yeah, God is long suffering. <laughs> we should we should certainly be praying for false teachers that they will come to accept the gospel that they that they are perverting. Anyone else? I see another hand. Yes. Sir. I've spent a long time in the Catholic Church, and I think they've got a perverted understanding of what grace is. This grace is something that is earned. Um, I was taught that sacraments, they have seven sacraments in that church. And the definition of a sacrament was an outward sign instituted by Christ that gives grace. Mm -hmm. So that when we do the sacrament, when we do the work of the sacrament, we're, sacrament, we're paid with grace. Yeah. And, and that's another gospel. Yeah. The definition, grace by definition, is unmerited favor. If you can, if you can earn it, it's a wage. It's not grace. If 
but grace is only unmerited. Yeah, the, seven, the, the idea of sacraments, a means of grace, is work salvation. Absolutely. It's, it's another gospel. Anyone else? Good comment. Yes, ma'am. I've had friends and relatives who are Pentecostal, and they, they say they believe in Jesus Christ, and they, you know, they, they do the salvation thing, but then they have to do right to keep their salvation. Yeah. So it ends up being the same, doesn't it? They, they, they're adding works to their grace. If you have to earn it, if you have to get it by your works, or you have to keep it by your works. Yes. Either way, it's by your works. And you cannot reason with them. No. They won't hear it. I've, I've been down that road a few times. Yeah. It's, if, it's, if it is truly of God and not of works, then, then when I, again, when I add the works, if works are making me saved or if works are keeping me saved, it still works. And it you can't, negates you can't buy your salvation to begin with, then how are you going to make payments on them? Yeah, yep. <laughs> it's, it's paid for. You don't need to make payments. Yeah, yeah. very good. Anyone else? I'm just trying to add work to it or something like that. You're insulting God and getting your name by signing up. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. I, I was amazed as I was studying this. How what we looked at this morning with the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees and their self-righteousness that was gained through works dovetails with this because it's the same thing. It's that same, it's the same perversion of the gospel. When you say, Oh, you you of course you can you can be right with God. You just have to do. No. No. If you start doing, then you're negating grace. And it, it leads to a terrible place. I, I think that's why he starts off in verse 3 with this wish for grace and peace. Because you lose both. If you, if you say, well, you have to work for your salvation. You have, to be, you have to be circumcised. You have to keep the ceremonial law. There's grace is gone. And again, where there is no grace, there is no peace. So the two go hand in hand. And we're going to see there's an, there's an awful lot more. Read, read through the, next, the first chapter of Galatians with what we've looked at tonight in mind. And, and you'll see lights will start to come on on a lot of different passages. And you'll understand, boy, that, that's what he's talking about. You'll see it in a new light. And I would encourage you to do so. Well, let's bow for a word of prayer here this evening. Our Father, we come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we come because of your grace. And Lord, we come to you through faith. And Lord, we thank you that that's all it is. Lord, we thank you that the gospel is not this convoluted, complicated system of works. Lord, we know that if that was the case, we could never have peace. And so Lord, we thank you for your grace. And Lord, we thank you for the peace that can be ours. But Lord, even as we sit here and we think on and we thank you for the peace that we have, each of us is very likely aware of at least some people who are without that peace because they're trying to earn their way into your favor. Lord, I pray that you would use this study and, and, and our, our regular study of your word, Lord, to equip us to share the true gospel, the gospel of, of true a relationship with you by grace through faith in the finished work of your son. I pray that you'd help us to be actively sharing that gospel. Lord, help us as we do see false teachers on a regular basis. I pray that we would be discerning. Lord, that we would have the discernment to shut them off, to shut the book, to turn off the radio, or whatever the case may be, Lord, that we wouldn't allow that, that nonsense, that perverted gospel into our thinking. Pray that you'd protect us as we go. Lord, we thank you once again for your grace, for your peace. Lord, I pray that you keep us safe as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen.